Okay, so we have a 3,600 square foot, three bedroom plus studio, four bathroom, four and a half baths um, with a pool, his and her salons, paddle court golf simulator. Um, was this purchase in the context that I mentioned about the cost of living crisis that Canadians are facing, was this flagged uh, for the minister? So the Treasury Board Secretariat role, and I'm quoting, in procurement includes developing, implementing, monitoring, and renewing procurement-related policies and instruments. What we've heard today is that uh, you only do that once a purchase or an acquisition is over $10 million. Is that correct? Is, is it a requirement of Mr. Clark's... Uh, position as Council General in New York that he has white Makuba stone floors. Is that a requirement? That's not I'm just a, curious. It's not a charging board requirement. Okay. In, in a fairly short space of time, in about a, a two-year period, the government of Canada made three distinct moves. First, they raised the limit on the value of property that one department could purchase on their own authority. They raised it from $4 million to $10 million. That reduced accountability and oversight. Then they appointed Tom Clark, appointed by the Prime Minister to be the Consul General in New York. Uh, and then immediately with this, this new uh, hyper well-connected person in as Consul General, it became a Government of Canada priority to purchase a new residence. The annual cost for this new property is more, and we just heard one of our colleagues from Fredericton, New Brunswick, is more than the actual purchase price of properties in her hometown. Do you not think this is a real problem with the government of Canada? Um, I don't have anything further than I can Sky's the limit, that. I guess, so long as it meets the mission's needs. That's, no. that's what I'm hearing as a taxpayer. No. So long as it meets the mission needs, it is. the cost be damned. This guy's garage. Like and subscribe. Everyone, welcome to meeting number 134 of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Government Operations and Estimates. As we all know, it as the mighty OGO. Before we start, if you just oblige me, colleagues, I want to uh, just pay tribute to three members of Parliament who passed recently who were um, integral in uh, getting OGO uh, operating years ago. Uh, MP Marlene Catterall, who was from Ottawa, West Nepean. Uh, Mr. John Williams, who was from Edmonton, St. Albert, and uh, Chuck Stroll from uh, BC, uh, Chilliwack area. The three of them saw a need for better uh, oversight of government spending in the estimates process, so started the process back in a joint report in, to PROC in 1998, recognizing that vast sums of money spent by the government are subjected to only perfunctionary parliamentary scrutiny. They got a report through uh, to PROC, and then Mr. Strahl managed to get it uh, tabled in PROC and passed. That led to the creation of what has become the mighty OGO. So I just want to take a moment and thank you, everyone, that we recognize the passing of our three valued colleagues who were so important. So we'll start with uh, six minutes with Mr. Barrett, please. So we're asking you these questions today in the context that we live in Canada. That's with housing prices having doubled, rent having doubled, and we have uh, one in four Canadians saying that they're going to be relying on food banks uh, this fall. And at the same time, we have the Prime Minister's media buddy who gets a um, well-paid uh, government appointment in New York City, and the existing multi-million dollar condo is deemed not good enough, and a $9 million luxury condo is... Um, is purchased for his exclusive use. I'll start with you, Ms. Tattersall. Who signed off on the decision? So as I said in my opening remarks, the decision was taken under the authority of global affairs. So who signed off would have followed the delegation instrument within global affairs. Okay, so from your department, who was the most senior person who touched the file? So... Nobody touched the file at Treasury Board Secretariat because the transaction fell within the limits of, of $10 million. Of $10 million. Okay. So the decision was at Global Affairs. Um, Mr. Quinlan, you're an assistant deputy minister. Um, who was the most senior person in your department who signed off uh, or touched this file? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The chief appraiser in this case, uh, um, Madam Shaw, who's accompanying me today, was the person, the most senior person who uh, dealt with this file. Okay, so we have a 3,600 square foot, three bedroom plus studio, four bathroom, four and a half baths um, with a pool, his and her salon's paddle court golf simulator. Um, was this purchase, in the context that I mentioned about the cost of living crisis that Canadians are facing, was this flagged uh, for the minister? Madame Bouchard, as the most as the most senior person in your department who touched the file, um, this this excessive per, this opulent purchase uh, was this was this not something that merited um, the awareness of the minister? Merci pour votre question. Thank you for that question. The Chief Appraiser of Canada does not have the mandate to evaluate the merits of a given transaction or the decision to acquire or dispose of a property. My mandate is simply to take a given address and ensure that it is appraised. For deciding the value that Canadians get for the purchase, you decide the value of the asset. Who is responsible, and uh, I'm not sure if Treasury Board or um, if, if one of you folks would like to respond, but who ultimately is responsible for the value that workers in Western Canada, workers um, in the prairies, workers in, in Ontario, Quebec, the Atlantic provinces, what value do they get for this $9 million luxury suite for uh, Justin Trudeau's buddy? What, Where's the value for Canadian taxpayers here? He, he, he was living in a house paid for by the taxpayers. So if it's helpful to the committee in the examination, I can talk through the principle of, vet, of best value. That sits within the Treasury Board policy. Okay. So um, I, when we're talking about best value, I... I I'm not looking for um, I'm not looking for chapter and verse on uh, on what the policy says. Um, what I'm looking for is the practical application of that. So it falls below a threshold of ten million dollars, and and therefore doesn't you know uh, trigger the need for Treasury Board review, which I think is um, that's wild. Uh, it, you know, in in this respect, um, multi million dollar estates not triggering the review of Treasury Board. We've seen at this committee before and others where uh, liberal members have said that, well, you know, this, these decisions are all left to bureaucrats. There's absolutely no ministers who are responsible for, for any of the tens of millions of dollars that get spent. So um, this, this is a uh, condo on Billionaire's Row in Manhattan. Um, we have government facilities available to the appointee to host meetings um, that aren't uh, next to his bedroom. So what, what, is the, what is the value that Canadians get for this $9 million purchase in Manhattan? So if it's helpful, I can explain that you only hold real property to serve a program purpose. So there's two aspects, I think, to the questions that you may have. One, which is, what are the programmatic mission requirements that would drive the decision to have an official residence in a specific area. Those are driven by global affairs, and I think in the submission to the committee, they reference their policy that drives those requirements. So real property exists for requirements, and then when they go to acquire, what I would expect to see and what I think this committee would want to hear from global affairs about is, did they undertake a cost, like a full life cycle cost analysis of the different options. Did they look at keeping it and making the upgrades? Did they look at what the cost, the full cost, would be of acquiring something new, either through a purchase or through a lease? And what was the results of that analysis, and did it show the value? So that's, that's sort of what the Treasury Board policy sets out, and there's two aspects to that. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Uh, Jouari, go ahead, please. Has there been transaction in the past that you may be aware of that fell under the threshold 
and um, they basically said, well, you know, we're gonna we're gonna conduct a transaction. We don't have to gonna specifically report to TBS or TBS that it fell under the you know threshold. Therefore, we're not gonna review it. So there's lots of transactions that will happen across government that take place within departments that f fall within their transaction limits. Uh, on average, what's the size of these transactions? Do you have any idea? And I know it's under the threshold, so you... Uh, I do, so I don't... It, it's a good question uh, because it falls under the threshold. I, I don't have a line of sight I into that. I think it would be an interesting question for GAC to understand what their transactions are. I do know, I, I tried to prepare a bit for this committee, I do know the, a, a lot of their transactions will actually be in respect of leases because they do a lot of real property transactions for staff quarters. But in terms of the amount and for what, the higher dollar ones will typically be related to official residences or chanceries. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Mrs. Vignola, please. Merci beaucoup, Mr. Thank you very much, Chair. Ladies, uh, sir, thank you for uh, coming in on this uh, chilly, almost autumnal summer day. Ms. Tattersall, a few minutes ago, you noted that the threshold was established in 1993 and has, it has been adjusted since then. When was the last adjustment that set the value at 10 million? Merci pour la question. Thank you for that question. The last time the limit was reviewed was 2022. My, my colleagues have canvassed a number of uh, aspects of this, and I understand that you know the, the uh, extent or the, the breadth of questioning is somewhat limited given uh, TSB and PSPC's limited role. I, I'm curious, though, how far back the basic process, the basic structure for these kinds of transactions, we've talked a little bit about the policies that are in place and the procedures, um, how far back do those procedures go? And, and perhaps this is a, a question for um, Ms. Tattersall from TSB. So... Um... The current directive has been in effect since 2021, but there was a policy on real property in advance of that. I don't know how far back it goes, but it goes back a far way, so it would have covered transactions for decades now, but the current policy goes back to 2021. And following on my colleague Ms. Vignola's uh, question about the um, increase in the threshold that was made in 2022 when it was increased from 4 million to 10 million. I, I'm wondering what the what the rationale, um, I assume that there was a request from Global Affairs to increase the limit. What was the rationale for increasing the limit? Because obviously it comes at the costs of reduced scrutiny, reduced accountability, reduced transparency, all of those things. What was the rationale that was provided for that uh, quite significant increase in the threshold? So the thresholds have an expiry date. So uh, the last time that the threshold for an acquisition for an official residence had been updated was in uh, 2006, and that's when the four million had uh, been set up. There was 16 years in between that. So the business case looked at um, inflation over the 16 years, the changes in the market conditions, the real property market conditions, and then um, it may be um, important to hear from uh, GAC officials as well, but they basically, as my understanding from that um, increase, they looked at 23 different markets because GAC has missions in, I think, a over 100 countries. So they looked at 23 different markets and looked at the average price for an acquisition of an official residence. And it was on that basis that the update to the limit was made. Again, as I, I previously said, that those limits are looked at um, from uh, on a regular basis, and the next time the scheduled review of those limits are is in 2026. What would the downside or the risks be of leaving the $4 million limit in place to ensure greater um, scrutiny of these transactions? So first, I think it's important uh, to note that global affairs 
even if they're taking the transaction under their own authorities, still has to ensure that they have the proper due diligence, the proper scrutiny, the proper decision making. So I just I think that's an important first. Uh, the next thing would be to understand what their um, real property holdings are. And so um, I don't know if I have details on uh, that, but typically I think it's a question for GAC as to how many official residences or chanceries that they own around the world and how that would bump up against the limit. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the bigger ones, uh, the more complex ones that may have a project element would uh, certainly uh, come into the board if it was over their risk and capacity. But uh, I just, yeah, I don't have anything else to answer, uh, to add. Thank you very much, Chair. And I just want to continue along the lines of some of my colleagues, but also just to establish an understanding about PSPC's role when it comes to um, the real property that the Government of Canada holds, as well as the Treasury Board Secretariat's role. So PSPC is the real property manager for the Government of Canada. Is that correct? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, PSPC manages uh, the most of the office portfolio for the Government of Canada, roughly a quarter of the real property holdings, if you um, think of square meters of uh, office space or, or other kinds of special purpose space. Uh, and uh, PSBC also manages a large portfolio of uh, engineering assets, infrastructure, things like dams and bridges. Okay. Does PSPC provide any sort of oversight to the property that we own in other countries? Uh, no, as previously indicated in my opening remarks, uh, PSPC's role following Treasury Board um, uh, policy, uh, Treasury Board Secretary policy, uh, is to provide the appraisal services. Okay, so I'm wondering if both you and Ms. Tattersall would be willing to table your opening remarks to the committee. Uh, Absolutely, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. We used to receive them ahead of a committee uh, meeting and um, would be happy to have those in writing. Um, so when GAC purchases property, are those properties registered with PSPC? Or where are they registered? Well, with regards to PSPC, uh, we do not have a registry uh, of properties outside of uh, PSPC's portfolio, with some very limited exceptions. So I can uh, turn to Treasury Board to complete that answer. So GAC would be the custodian for the real property. And you can either acquire it or they could uh, it could be crown leased when they have it. Okay, so I know that you spoke about... Um, the real property holdings of GAC. Um, I would appreciate it if you would table that list that you referenced uh, to the committee. Would it be, I, I think I asked how many. I think okay. GAC officials, I, I would feel more comfortable if you got it directly from sure. the department and their holdings. I will, yeah. I will do that tomorrow okay. for sure. So who writes the guidelines for real property purchases? on behalf of the Government of Canada? So we have a Treasury Board policy that sets the framework. And then within that, there is a requirement that in each custodian department, so GAC being a custodian department, has a senior designated official that is appointed responsible for the management of real property within, within GAC. And they would have a real property management framework that they're responsible for that would set out how things are done within GAC. So the Treasury Board Secretariat role, and I'm quoting, in procurement includes developing, implementing, monitoring, and renewing procurement-related policies and instruments. That it also evaluates business proposals, monitors bidding processes, and ensures compliance with policies and standards. What we've heard today is that uh, you only do that once a purchase or an acquisition 
is over $10 million. Is that correct? So maybe first, when we talk about real property acquisition, it's the directive on the management of real property that applies, not the procurement policy. Okay. And so, as I said in my opening remarks, we set the administrative framework, and then if an acquisition or a disposition is over the limits that a department has, it would come to Treasury Board for authority. Thank you. So where did the departments get um, the funding for these types of purchases? Is that budgeted for in the um, annual budget of the Government of Canada? That's a great question. I'm going to flip to a page. So uh, most custodians will have a capital budget. That is where they get the funding for investments in, in real property. Um, so, for example, GAC's um, Vote 5 capital budget so I, uh, for 2024-25 is $192 million. So they have a capital budget that is responsible for those expenditures, which is then voted on through the estimates process. So they have this pool of money that's provided to them in the budget, and then through the estimates process, do they provide a, um, a vote highlighting what they are actually spending this money on? So it would be considered sort of A-based fund funding. So they have so many um, real property assets that they have A-based funding to help manage all of those assets, and that's in their vote five, and that would be... Uh, in their estimates. So because Thank they... Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Atwin, go ahead, please. What is this residence used for? Um, you know, Mr. Barrett suggested that it's for the, um, you know, sole use, exclusive use of this, of our one representative, but what is this residence actually used for? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would agree with the uh, premise and the question that it is, this would be a question for GAC officials and uh, PSPC would not be the appropriate department to answer. Okay, Ms. Tattersall, would you like to add anything there? No, I, I think GAC sets out the, the mission requirements for that official residence. They'd be best positioned to okay. respond. Um, and I understand the previous uh, property was an uh, estimated value of $13 million, is that correct? Could See, be confirmed uh, through uh, Chief Appraiser... Uh, interim Chief Appraiser, Madame Bouchard, but uh, that is also my understanding. Madame Bouchard? Oui, merci. Uh, en fait... Thank you. The $14 million you saw was the current asking price for the previous residency. Um, so can perhaps Madame Bouchard or anyone, could you speak to the key differences between this residence versus the, the previous one that we've now um, offloaded to purchase this new one? Donc, oui, je peux vous en parler brièvement. I can speak to that briefly. The goal of today's discussion was to talk about the transaction for 111 West 57th Street. The information I have on the other report is limited. Also, given that the residence is currently up for sale, I need to limit the information that I can provide on its appraisal. What I can say is that the unit currently up for sale was larger when compared to the one we are studying today. The Park Avenue residence had a better view than the recently acquired property. It's located on the 12th floor of a 17-story building in a residential neighborhood in the Upper East Side neighborhood, which is mostly residential and considered quite desirable to live in. Meanwhile, the property acquired on uh, West 57th Street is in a building that, a heritage building, with an annex built on. The unit in question is uh, on the 11th floor in the annex. 
the first residential story of the building. Everything below that is uh, non-residential. And next onto it is the famous uh, skyscraper that can be seen as part of the New York skyline. I would say, overall, the location of the unit within the building is different, as well as the location of the building within the city of New York, and the size and view of the unit. Those would be the differences between the two units. Thank you very much. I'm hearing a lot about location and certainly, you know, more of an ideal place perhaps for some of the work um, that, you know, that is done and conducted in that residence. Are there, I, I come to understand there was also some issues with code. Um, can anyone speak to the, the previous residents not being up to code or up to perhaps accessibility standards? Is this one of the, uh, you know, parts of the conversation would have gone into this new acquisition was around accessibility or, or meeting codes or, you know, is there, can you ex speak to why we have this new residence? I would start perhaps by, again, uh, indicating that the, these decisions uh, were decisions made by Global Affairs Canada, um, uh, and PSPC provided the appraisal services, but the decision uh, really uh, belongs to Global Affairs Canada. Right. Well, I very much look forward to asking them these same questions tomorrow as well. Um, so I certainly appreciate your, your best attempts um, at explaining some of the, you know, the the thoughts that I think are going through many of our minds right now. Um, and just in general, as my, my time kind of runs down, have you personally dealt with uh, any similar cases like this where residence or real property was bought to replace one that was being sold? We, what I can speak to in the context of PSPC's responsibilities, notably for the office portfolio, is that we regularly uh, look at our assets um, that we own and assets that we lease and uh, make a number of decisions uh, in order to right-size um, the Government of Canada's office uh, portfolio. And in fact, following the last budget, uh, we are following government direction to significantly reduce uh, that office portfolio over uh, the next 10 years. And that will require uh, us to um, uh, dispose of a number of properties um, that we currently have. And, uh, acquire new leases in certain cases um, and the properties that we will uh, dispose of. Uh, many of them, uh, again, following government direction, will be uh, put to contribute to be converted into housing. So decisions are made in that regard, and I can speak to the responsibilities for PSPC. But going back to, uh, to this particular transaction, Global Affairs Canada would be uh, well suited to answer your questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Brock, go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair. Before I get into my substantive questions, I'm just curious, uh, in relation to another Justin Trudeau uh, scandal, the Arrive scam, uh, it was revealed that prior to a first committee attendance, the president of the CBSA, the deputy minister, was summoned to the prime minister's office, presumably for coaching. Have either of you, and Mr. Quinlan on screen, has anyone received coaching prior to your appearance today? Was anyone? Correct. No? Mr. Quinlan? No, no one was answering. Mr. Chair, sorry, just to uh, answer uh, the, the question directly, the answer is no. Thank you. No one was required to attend the Prime Minister's office? No? Mr. Quinlan? The answer is uh, no, Mr. Chair. Did anyone get direction from the Minister, in your case, Minister Duclos? Uh, no direction, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Now, I know there is a lot that has been written in our nationals with respect to the extravagant nature of this acquisition. There was a quote from Global Affairs, I appreciate, not attributable to anyone here, but I wish to read it out to the record. The residence currently used for the head of mission and council general in New York, this is the Park Avenue property, was purchased in 61, last refurbished in 82, the apartment does not meet new building codes nor global affairs standards. Now, the purchase uh, at um, West 57th is listed as follows. There is an elegant entry foyer with white Makuba stone floors. Is that a requirement for the Council General of Canada? 
perhaps in answering that question, I've, I've sort of alluded to it before. You only hold real property to support. That, man, that's not my question. Right. Is, is it a requirement of Mr. Clark's uh, position as Council General in New York that he has white Makuba stone floors? Is that a requirement? That's not I'm a, just curious. It's not a charging board requirement. Okay. A stunning powder room finished in jewel onyx. Another requirement of that Council not, General? Uh, of the Treasury Board Secretariat? That would not be a okay. requirement in our policy. Custom smoke gray oak floors in a parquet pattern. Would that be a requirement, Mr. Clark? So I think all my answers to your questions will be, no. will be yeah. Yeah. The condo includes three bedrooms, a study, four and a half bedrooms, including one, this is the master bathroom, clad in Italian white Venato marble and featuring a freestanding copper soaking tub handcrafted by William Holland and custom bronze fixtures by P.E. Guerin. Now, again, I'll ask the same question that you can answer, whether or not that's Mr. Clark's requirements or, or Council General's requirements. But you talk about this being an investment. Uh, low cost is not always the best value. There are starving Canadians who are relying on food banks who would love to have a real property investment in New York with these type of features. Do you see the disconnect between what the government is doing and the reality on the Canadian streets? You see that distinction? So I totally appreciate your okay. comments. And I, go for, I go further. The, the amenities include a 25-meter two-lane swimming pool with private cabanas, a separate sauna and treatment rooms, a fitness center, a residence lounge, and access to a paddle court, a golf simulator. I'd love to have a golf simulator sitting in my basement, but I'm not Justin Trudeau's friends. So friends of Justin Trudeau get to explore these wonderful, wealthy amenities while the rest of us Canadians have to struggle. Do you see the problem that the government of Canada has with respect to this purchase? The optics are very, very poor. And I know you talk about a threshold of up to $10 million, but you didn't have to buy right at the foot of Central Park. Manhattan is a big island. Why does, the, why does the Council General require that proximity to Central Park? Why does he have to have all of these luxury amenities while the rest of us suffer in this country? Why? So I think a good response to, to get to your to response to your question and I think it's alluded to in the package that was submitted to this committee, is the mission requirements are established by Global Affairs under their property management manual. So I think when Global Affairs officials are here, they should be able to walk through those how they set out those requirements for an official residence. Those Canadians deserve an answer. Thank you very much. You. Um, Mr. Baines, please go ahead. So, you know, in essence, all levels of government buy and sell properties. This is something that is done. And, and there's a level of maintenance that's required. You know, we see, um, you know, properties that may need, um, you know, may need to be up to standard, up to code. Like, w what are some of those requirements? Maybe, you know, accessibility. Um, are there... Were there issues in, in this uh, case with, with respect? I, I understand there was some discussion around uh, the uh, previous um, um, uh, residents being not up to code. If you can maybe talk a little bit about that, the standards and the code of uh, what's required in, in the properties that are being purchased. What do they need? What are what what? things should they have, uh, whether it's uh, accessibility to people with disabilities or things of that nature? I'll, sorry, I'll, I'll start the answer to that question. So consistent with Treasury Board policy, 
you would want to make sure that um, you, one, acquire and hold and maintain real property only to support a programmatic need of a department. So the requirements around the need for an official residence and what those specifications look like would be set by Global Affairs. They have that authority pursuant to the departmental legislation, so that's the first. And then there are requirements around ensuring that the real property supports broader government priorities. That would include greening. That would include accessibility. So those factors should come into play in that business case that Global Affairs would have undertaken to support the transaction. Thank you very and much. Is that? I'm sorry, that is okay. past our time, Mr. Baines. We'll now go to Mr. Uh, Genwes. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my key initial question here is is the why, um, because all in, in a fairly short space of time, in about a, a two year period, the government of Canada made three distinct moves. First, they raised the limit on the value of property that one department could purchase on their own authority. They raised it from four million to ten million. That reduced accountability and oversight. Then they appointed Tom Clark, appointed by the Prime Minister to be the Consul General in New York, uh, and then. Immediately, with this this new uh, hyper well connected person in as consul general, it became a government of Canada priority to purchase a new residence. So you have these three things happening in close succession, and it seems to me that the timing is highly suspicious. There was no indication uh, prior to uh, Mr. Tom Clark getting this appointment uh, that there was a, a, a there was a, a lot of discussion around a need for a, a new residence, and yet immediately he takes this position. And uh, and all of a sudden, uh, Global Affairs is talking about the need for uh, a brand new, what turned out to be luxury residence for the brand new, politically well connected Consul General. Uh, so, to the officials, uh, do you know, or at least officially, who it was that started the conversation about the alleged need for a new residence? Who was it that 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 said, "Hey, we we uh, we should get a new a new residence in New York." So I'll answer for Treasury Board Secretariat. Uh, those decisions uh, occurred under GAC's authority, so we, we don't have a line of sight as to what precipitated uh, the purchase. The only information I can refer to is what was provided to this committee, which they okay, talked just, about. Just, but, yeah. but, but it was initiated within the department. Correct. It, there, there, you, it wasn't... Uh, the PSBC or Treasury Board or any other department saying, "Hey, hey, by the way, it looks like we might need this." It was, it was, you know, Tom Clark, new Consul General, comes in close to the Prime Minister, and then Global Affairs is on their own authority initiating this conversation about a new residence. So I would answer that any decisions on this matter would have occurred within Global Affairs. Okay. Uh, for the chief uh, appraiser, I want to clarify uh, on the, the asking price versus the appraised value of the previous property. Uh, it, it was implied by some of my liberal colleagues that the appraised value was the same as, as the asking price. Could you just, just very clearly clarify, is the asking price the same as the appraised value of the property? Merci pour la question. En fait Thank you for that question. The property, as described in the appraisal report, had been on the market for a number of months. The price had been adjusted a few times. Yes, it's a simple question. I'm talking about the, the, the previous property, not the newly acquired property, the okay. previous property. Okay. The, the, uh, is, is the asking price the same as the appraised value, uh, or are they different? As I noted earlier, I cannot go into details about the first appraisal report produced on that property because the property. That, that, that's all I'm looking for. Just, just, just the clarification. So anyone who's making public comments about uh, what the value of that of that property is, uh, politicians or otherwise, uh, you know, doesn't. Uh, isn't isn't doing so on any on any factual basis. Um, the previous property has not sold yet, correct? À ma connaissance, elle est toujours avant. To my knowledge, it is still up for sale. Okay. All right. So so there there is a lot of misinformation being pushed on this, uh, particularly by supporters of the government. Uh, uh, based on our own research, we've seen that 
properties in the same building uh, have sold substantially under asking price or have even been taken off the market uh, once once put on. Uh, so I think that's that's important for the committee to note. Who decided on the asking price? Uh, was that was that you? Was that within Global Affairs? Who decided the asking price for that uh, previous property? As noted in Mr. Quinlan's opening remarks, one of the foundations of the process and the... J'y arrive, j'y arrive. I'm getting there. I can say that the decision was not made by the chief appraiser. Our job is to provide an appraisal for a given... La décision de fixer un... Le... The decision to set the asking price. Is that what you're asking? Yes, exactly. OK. Je, dans, le, dans ce cas précis... Je... In this precise case, I would suggest that you ask that question to Global Affairs Canada. Okay, so this is this this is the problem, right? Is is uh, the government uh, sorry. wants to trump it? The asking price is if it means something Mr. Uh, but for the appraiser who appraised it, and that's completely yeah. separate. We don't even know who said in the asking price. Sorry, Chair. I'm done. Yeah, we are out of time. Although, Ms. Bouchard, um, a very clear question was asked to you. If you do not know who set the price, please just say I do not know. But if you do know who set the price, as Mr. Genius was asking, I would ask you to present that answer to us. Je ne sais pas qui a fixé le prix. I do not know who set the asking price, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I have five minutes. I'll keep my questions pretty tight because I do want to share my time with my colleague, Mr. Genuis. Prior to 2019, how many purchases over $4 million were referred to uh, Treasury Board Secretariat by Global Affairs Canada? A follow-up question in writing. I okay, you'll provide that to us? Uh, yep. Thank you very much. Um, between 2019 and 2022, how many requests were received um, by Global Affairs Canada to Treasury Board Secretariat over $4 million before the policy changed? So any sort of how many transactions exceeded their, their limits? I'd have to come back with an answer. So, in essence, um, a policy was changed in 2022, but you don't have the numbers to give us to demonstrate perhaps why the limit had to increase from $4 million to $10 million. So, uh, two separate things. The transaction limits are reviewed on a regular basis. Right, right. And then the policy was updated. Those two weren't tied. You're asking for specific how many transactions exceeded those limits. I don't have that information with so, me here today. So you're saying the raise in the limit was not tied to the number of requests TBS would have been receiving over that $4 million threshold. So the business case would have been related to uh, not just the transactions, but also a market analysis, a look at the increased inflation, it also was substantiated by a review by uh, Global Affairs of 23 okay. markets and what the average price of acquisition was for it. Okay, thank you for that. Um, many times you've indicated that TBS did not or does not have eyes on the real property purchases under the threshold of $10 million and that Global Affairs actually has to be able to demonstrate due diligence in following the framework that has been given to them for the purchasing of real property, who do they demonstrate that due diligence to? So within a department, accountability rests at the deputy head. And at then the, deputy the deputy minister so, level? So the deputy head, yep. And the deputy head under the current policy will appoint a senior designated official responsible okay. for real property, and they will set out their real property management framework. So when GAC is here, they could outline Okay. what their framework is, and their delegations, and right. their governance. But they basically demonstrate due diligence to themselves. Nobody else has any role to play in, in actually assuring that Global Affairs Canada is following due diligence. So part of the external element is the appraisal that is provided okay. by an external party. Thank you. I'll turn my time over. Thank you, Chair. 
In terms of cost to taxpayers, uh, it's important to underline that we haven't sold one residence and purchased another. We currently have two Consul General's residences in New York, each of which have very substantial carrying costs. Tom Clark was apparently so keen on a new luxury condo that they bought that condo before even listing the existing property with no guarantee that it would sell at an acceptable price. Uh, in general, as it relates to the Treasury Board policy, would you say it's a best practice to secure a buyer for the first property uh, before purchasing the second? So our policy doesn't speak to sequencing. Our policy speaks to making decisions based on uh, the full life cycle costs. So the sequencing and how that is determined would be set out within the department. Okay. Do you, do you think it's common sense that we don't need two consul general's residences in New York and that you need to make sure that you're going to be able to sell the first at an acceptable price before you purchase the second, and also that you don't want to be responsible for very significant carry, uh, carrying costs for two properties on an ongoing basis. Would that seem to you like common sense? I would say from a how I'm managing my real property portfolio, I would want to understand their sequencing that they've taken and if they've included those costs into their life cycle cost analysis. Right, but I just just from a common sense perspective, though, I mean, mo most people uh, that are that are pinching their pennies, uh, we're, we're going through a cost of living crisis. Many Canadians can't afford homes at all, uh, but most people don't go out and purchase the second home before they've begun the process of selling their first home uh, because they don't want to be on the hook for the costs associated with owning two homes at once over a long period of time. Uh, and and again, this this first property wasn't even listed until last week, essentially immediately before these committees were were, were starting. Uh, shouldn't the government of Canada apply these these common sense, real world insights to their decisions around real property? I think I would want to understand from GAC officials when they started the process to ready the property for disposition, and how that figured into their strategy around the replacement of the official residence. I wanted to talk about some of the protocols and rules around uh, the management of real property, uh, including the directive on the management of real property, uh, which states that acquiring property must be done in a manner that is fair and aligns with commercial real estate practices. Is there any, any reason that you have to suspect that this part of the directive was not followed? Is there anything from what you've read followed uh, that says uh, that uh, that part of the directive was not followed? when it comes to uh, it being fair, the process being fair and aligning with commercial real estate practices? Answer that question. Um, when we talk about fair, we talk about the fact that they um, looked at options based on the requirements, that there was a process to identify all properties, uh, that they did market testing by engaging a broker, that they undertook an appraisal, and by aligned with commercial real estate practices, it would mean that they followed the legal due diligence uh, process, the commercial practices in New York. What I know from what's been submitted to this committee is that they undertook a, an appraisal, uh, that they engaged a broker, and my understanding from talking with officials at Global Affairs that they undertook a financial analysis of the options. That's what I know. So is there is there any evidence from what you've seen to tell you that this was this part of the directive was not met? Um, is there ev any evidence that you've seen? Given that uh, the only information I have is what's been publicly available, I can only relay rely on what has been submitted to this committee. OK, so you haven't seen any evidence to the contrary that would contradict or violate the directive. Uh, from what has been submitted. No, but I think the part of the evaluation of this committee is to to make sure that GAC followed the the uh, sure. the policy, and I think that's, that's for sure. We'll we'll follow purpose. up with GAC tomorrow, but but today I just wanted from your perspective, uh, the directive on the management of real property talks about highlights sound stewardship. Based on what you've read and seen, is there any evidence to say that uh, that sound stewardship has not been followed? I really do think that's a question for global affairs officials. 
Um, okay. They have the details of the transaction. I don't have access to all the details. What I have access okay. to is what's been provided to this committee. Right. I'm just asking you based on what you've seen. Um, based on what you've seen, has sound stewardship been followed from what you've seen? I appreciate the question. I really do think global affairs officials need to answer that question. Thanks very much. Uh, okay. We'll go to you, Mr. Brock, please. Is a feasibility study mandatory for the repair, renovation, or purchase of a diplomatic or official residence pursuant to Government of Canada policies? Now you're testing me, but I would say if you're making a renovation, you would undertake an analysis like it would be a project, so you would do uh, the normal pre-project definition options analysis before you would get into okay. the actual implementation. So in relation to the existing property owned by the Government of Canada at 550 Park Avenue before the decision was made to purchase West 57th, was a, feasi was a feasibility study prepared in relation to that transaction? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. That would be something that GAC officials would be able to answer what they looked at in terms of the renovation uh, okay. cost. Can anyone on this panel uh, weigh in on that uh, answer? Anybody? No? Okay. So in your opinion, uh, Ms. Tatterstall, would it be GAC who's responsible for the creation of a feasibility study if one was done pursuant to policy? So yes, as the real property custodian, they would be responsible for uh, looking at any sort of options analysis before <coughs> undertaking a renovation. Thank you. I know that there is a talking point that the purchase of the new property is smaller, it was more economical for the taxpayer, but very, very light in terms of details. I know the current property, the new property, is just under 3,600 square feet. What was the square footage of the property on Park Avenue? Anyone have an answer to that? I don't know. Um, so, thank you, Mr. We, Chair, we, for this. Oh, thank sorry. you. Sorry, Mark. I, I'll you, defer Mr. to uh, my colleague, uh, Director General. Uh, go ahead, Linda. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the speaker for the question. Um, <laughs> the uh, the subject pro uh, property at five 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 uh, five fifty Park Avenue was three thousand eight hundred and seventy three square meters. Three thousand eight hundred and seventy three. So the new property is around two hundred square feet or square meters less. Would that be your understanding? Correct. Okay. That is a very interesting answer because according to GAC, there is um, a, a, an impression they're giving Canadians that this new move represented a saving opportunity of more than $2 million for Canadian taxpayers, that it would also reduce ongoing maintenance costs and property taxes and support future program needs. The new property has a carrying cost per year of $235,896 U.S., which is probably just under $400,000 Canadian per year. Specifically, taxes, $10,000 U.S. per month. Monthly common charges, uh, just under $9,600 U.S. dollars per month. Does anyone have any information with respect to the taxes and carrying costs on Park Avenue? Anyone? No, I don't have access to those. I don't think PSPC would either, but I would expect that when they did their life cycle cost analysis, that the, the operating costs of both properties would have been taken into consideration. The annual cost for this new property is more, and we just heard one of our colleagues from Fredericton, New Brunswick, is more than the actual purchase price of properties in her hometown. Do you not think this is a real problem with the government of Canada 
that the taxpayers we are paying out over four hundred thousand dollars Canadian per year just to allow Justin Trudeau's buddy to live in luxury in Manhattan is that acceptable to you as a taxpayer not only are you civil servants you're taxpayers is that acceptable to you so again what I would say is that the official residence is acquired to support a mission in New York. So the requirements for that would be established by GAC pursuant to their legislation. So they acquire that to achieve their mission results in New York. So uh, I don't have anything further than I can Sky's the limit, that. I guess, so long as it meets the mission's needs. That's, no. that's what I'm hearing as a taxpayer. No. So long as it meets the mission needs, it is the cost be damned. So consistent with Treasury Board policy, it is a balance, best value is a balance between the real property meeting the operational requirements with the cost of the acquisition and the maintenance over the life cycle of the asset. Thank you very Those much. Those are the questions I have. Thank you. Mr. Jory, do you finish up, please?